the Director of Life Sciences and Healthcare here at POSIT. Very excited to bring to you today the ninth installment of our Life Sciences series. Previously, we have highlighted Roche, BMS, Merck, GSK, Novaris, Johnson & Johnson, and others. And you can find these POSIT webinars linked below. And today we have an exciting webinar featuring the work of Novo Nordisk. And we're going to highlight the journey to an R-based FDA submission. And we'll kick off the presentation today with Ari, the principal statistical programmer. We'll then pass it over to Stefan, statistician. And then we'll end with Anders, statistical specialist. It's such an exciting time for open source drug development. From 2017 to 2020, uh, we had important things that had happened. R and Pharma, the R Validation Hub, the Pharmaverse, and then into 2021, we had an R pilot submission to the FDA. And now, a little over a year later, we have a full submission in R by Novo. And it's so exciting to see the pharmas are migrating to an open source backbone for their clinical reporting. And what sets Novo apart is the depth for which they're tackling this effort. The change management from a multilingual statistical computing environment to the package management and validation and to the end user support and education. For, for example, they even have their own internal R podcast. And all the while contributing to community efforts like R and Pharma, the Pharmaverse, the pilot submissions. And so it's with great joy to bring you this session today. And now I will pass it over to Ari. Thank you, Phil. We're uh, so excited to be here and uh, to be able to tell our story of all the ups and downs we've uh, experienced in the past few years. Before we begin, I just have to uh, say that this presentation represents the view of uh, the office and not necessarily no risk. And any of the regulatory communication that we'll show here will not be applicable to all projects. So please communicate with the appropriate health authorities about your submission. Without further ado, then earlier this year, we submitted our first R-based uh, submission to FDA, uh, PMDA, and other health authorities around the world. And this happened uh, early uh, 2023, and we have uh, multiple learnings and feedback from authorities that we will share uh, later on in the presentation as well. Incidentally, this year, uh, Novo Nordisk is actually celebrating its, its uh, 100th uh, anniversary. And Novo Nordisk started in 1923 as a Nordic Insulin Laboratory, and it was at a later merger with Novo Industry that the current name uh, Novo Nordisk was formed. Here in uh, Novo Nordisk, we focus on treatments for people living with uh, serious chronic diseases, and we have a strong history in diabetes and now uh, in obesity, for which you may know the company for. In biostatistics, where we three sit, uh, we work with the first uh, three steps uh, shown here. So we work with uh, clinical trials, uh, data and evidence generation, and approval activities. In the evidence uh, that we submit to authorities, we include uh, STDM and ADAM data sets that follow industry standards, such as uh, CDISC. We submit programs, documentation, analysis, tables, figures, listings, you name it. And what we're going to share today is uh, our story of getting to do all of this with uh, R. Now, going back to uh, the beginning, then there's one thing we really, really want to highlight and one thing that permeates everything in this presentation. And we put this quote on the slide that the goal is a transformation process that is revolutionary in result, but evolutionary in execution. Or in other words, it's more a matter of uh, taking steps rather than thinking about how big those uh, steps should be. Now, back in 2015, uh, we all joined the uh, biostatistics uh, in Novo to an environment where everything was dominated by the CES programming language. We loved R and we uh, quickly noticed a huge uh, R-shaped hole at uh, Novo. And to our surprise, uh, Git and version control systems uh, were also absent and we were not the first uh, to notice this here. So we got R installed on our uh, local computers and we used it every now and then for these uh, one-off non-critical tasks. 
In 2017, 2016, we started to uh, introduce uh, R to management and our stakeholders and colleagues for non-GXP related work, where we were showcasing uh, Shiny as an incredible, powerful framework for, uh, um, for data visualization that you just couldn't get anywhere else. We had a Shiny app for data exploration, the bottom one you see here, and one uh, for assistance in pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic uh, data reviews. We were also using R for crawling SAS logs, comparing stuff, and checking stuff. And development of this continued through 2017. And in 2018, uh, we continued to push for adopting some use of R. And the collection of uh, R programs we were using had grown so much that we now combined it, combined it into a single package uh, named NNR. And this package uh, was the first thing we put in, uh, in version control, and we also set up uh, pipelines for testing it. Now, come 2019, where we finally saw a commitment from above to report a trial in another language than CES. So I remember receiving this strategy email, and Stefan was sitting at the desk right next to mine. And I showed him this, and we literally ran into our manager and said, if anybody's going to do this, it has to be us. And, and it wouldn't take long until we got the nod to go ahead for this. And we both thought, shit, uh, it's real. How do we even uh, do this? Uh, we don't have a GXP environment for R. We don't have a system for packages. I mean, we don't even have a strategy for packages. Um, so we get down to this, and I'll hand it over to uh, Stefan to tell you more. Yes. So at this point, we are still using R from our local laptops without any system, basically, at all. So we were in dire need of a statistical computing environment. And actually, our initial thoughts regarding this new environment were in terms of stakeholders uh, and the change management of those. <laughs> so we wanted to produce table figures and listings that were identical to those they were already produced in SAS, because this would mean that there would be no change for the stakeholders regarding the language that we would choose. It would also mean that we could use the existing uh, workflows that we had set up for producing reports that we're gonna, going to send to authorities. And we could, on the same trial, work on both R and SAS. Um, we also wanted a system that were hassle-free for the end user. Um, so we were trying to cater to our colleagues that were used to programming SAS. So we really wanted to so that they didn't need to think so much about packages, environments, and such, uh, but more about getting to the actual programming. So it should also be so that if you got a code snippet from your colleague, you should be pretty sure that that would also work on your computer, given that you were using the same uh, version of R. And then finally, with this new SCE, we really wanted to highlight version control. So remember, at this time, we weren't using a version control basically at all. Uh, we had a few things that we had it on, but not for anything regarding trials. Uh, so here we wanted to produce an easy way for initiating a version control for both trial and a collaboration work, such as packages. We quickly saw that these uh, four uh, things would be the pillars of our infrastructure. We really wanted uh, an IDE based on RStudio um, Workbench, or the Posit Workbench, because it was such a great IDE uh, and familiar to so many R users. We did, however, want to make it the server-based solution so that you would simply log in to the server and be sure that you were in common ground with everybody else. Then we wanted to use Git for our version control, because they were so familiar with most of the R programmers as we had used it in the past. Um, and it will also come with uh, great features, such as feature branching for our development stuff. We wanted to use Azure DevOps, uh, both for project management, so for organizing tasks, but also for all of the code repositories uh, that we could share those. And of course, for CI CD pipelines. Um, 
And finally, but definitely not least, we wanted to use Deposit Package Manager uh, for all things regarding our packages. We wanted to use it to share our internal packages, and we also wanted to use it for creating subset of packages that we will call approved packages for use. Now, when we started working on this SCE, we were hit pretty hard by the number of things you need to consider for making a GXP compliant system. I won't go through all of these now, but suffice it to say that there is a lot to think about. Um, so instead of starting from scratch, we took a look at what do we already have? I mean, at the time we were able to produce all of the stuff that we needed uh, for the reports that were going to the to authorities. So instead of starting from scratch, we wanted to piggyback on what we already had. Um, so we wanted to launch a computer next to the one we already had. Now the one we already had were located somewhere in Copenhagen, having a file share with all of the data and output and such. So we wanted to put it next to it, except we didn't really want to put it next to it. We wanted to put it in the cloud uh, because we had no idea how many users were going to be on the system. There would probably be a few in the beginning and then a lot uh, as time progressed. Um, and luckily we got a really, really good a cloud architect to help us out on this. And together we quickly saw that in order to fill all of these uh, DXP requirements, we needed full infrastructure as code. And we needed to have version control on that code so that we could see who changed what and when. We also rather quickly identified the need of machine images. So for all of our compute instances, uh, it should be built on a machine image so that we could spin it up and be sure we would get the same result the next time uh, as we did before. And finally, as we didn't want to do in a manual task, we wanted to use uh, release pipelines for releasing the entire infrastructure uh, in different environments. So in 2020, we released our first uh, GXP um, classified environment for doing uh, our stuff. It would look something like this, where a user would come in from the uh, workbench. Here they would have access to the RStudio IDE. They could program in R, and they would have access to all of the packages they would need from the uh, Posit Package Manager. They could uh, see all of their repositories and get those from the Azure DevOps. And they could uh, store their code on a home directory, which was a file share uh, in the cloud. Now, we still had all of our data uh, residing uh, on our uh, old computer on the file share, which were located somewhere in Copenhagen. In terms of features, we didn't do much the first couple of years, but we did make a larger machines. Then we made more workbench machines and a load balancer in front. And then we made more workbench machines and still had low balance in front because of the growing need uh, for computation in regards to the users. And then come 2022, and we finally started to introduce new features. We introduced Python uh, on the Workbench server and PyPy on the Posit Package Manager. We introduced new IDEs so that the programmer would be able to select the IDE he or she was most comfortable with. Then we introduced a caching system. And this was because uh, the file share located uh, in Copenhagen had an insanely slow connection um, to the cloud. So this way, we would only have to wait for a data set to be transferred once, and then everybody else could use the data from the cache. We also released a Posit uh, Connect instance, um, mostly for uh, sharing our markdown documents and running Shiny applications. Now, this was built on the same image as the workbench machine, which meant that if it worked on the workbench machine, it would almost certainly also work on the connect instance. But we did have one problem that was still remaining here, and that were some users, regardless of how big we tried to make these uh, workbench machine, would hog up all of the resources that were available so in 2023, we finally uh, released a high-performance compute cluster in 
in the type of a Kubernetes cluster, where a user could spin up a, a Docker image. And through that, uh, they would get the entire uh, IDE, but they would be ensured that they would not step on the toes of anybody else, uh, any of the other users. And speaking of users, let's just take a look at the user uptake on this system. So here we have the tip depicted uh, the number of users that we have on the y-axis and the timeline on the x-axis. Um, and we can see that we didn't have that many users in the beginning, as we expected. Uh, these users were mainly those that were assigned to the trials that were going to produce uh, results that were going to use R for that. Uh, but as you can see, the time grows. We can see many, many, many more users. And in the end, we're actually not only supporting the biostatistics department, but also users from other departments within Novo Nordisk. Um, and I doubt we would have had such a great success in the user uptake on this system if we didn't have a really great strategy on handling packages. And now Anas will take us through the handling of these uh, packages from CRAN. Yeah, thank you for that, Stefan. So the NN package management really started in 2020 with the... Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Remember, that we, our organization was used to SAS and SAS only. So introducing a new language that is very much unlike SAS, that's challenging. So SAS is nice and simple. You need to install SAS 9.4. It's 10 years old. It has been patched a couple of times, but it's still in use. R, on the, on the other hand, that's not as simple. R is evolving at a higher pace. Uh, and R also has all of these packages. And each of these packages, they come with their own versions they come at different times, they have their own life. So these packages are what makes R great and powerful, but there is no free lunch. So dependencies between packages, they quickly become too complex if you just pick and choose your versions arbitrarily. You need, you'll quickly create a set of packages that does not work as intended together. So we wanted to create an environment that is sufficiently fixed and stable but still flexible, and we opted for this shared baseline model, as it has now become known. So here you log each version of R to a particular date and time, and you install packages in versions that were available at that given date. So we do this so that we know that any pair of dependent packages, they were tested at that point in time, and they were tested that they worked together. So that means that, for example, our R version 4.02 that's locked to some date in September 2020, that we will always get dplyr 102, despite how many ever many releases of dplyr that has been since. So teams simply just choose their version of R. They can deviate from the standard ones that we have in the system, but if they do so, they must use RNV. In general, we actually recommend that you always use RNV. So what packages can and should be used? Well, they can be roughly categorized in this way. So they are the base and recommended packages. Those are the ones that ship with R. They are low risk and they are very widely used. The contributed ones are the one we need to do a risk assessment on. So of these, there are the widely used ones. They are, they are low risk in, by virtue of the enormous user base. There is the well-tested and documented ones. They may be more niche, but they are still considered low risk. It is the risk that pose a problem. So when we do a risk assessment, we lean heavily on the R validation hub's recommendations on how to categorize. So the main points of categorization is the type of use, the maintenance, the popularity, and so on. So at the end of the day, this is just a human risk assessment. Uh, and the way we prompt this assessment to get made is by a, a Shiny app. So our users can, in the IDE via an add-in, they will be able to select a requester app, uh, and that simply starts up. So in the app, they can write what package they desire and the reason for it, and they can also see which R version and version of the package this will be available in. So when they submit this request, it gets a version controlled in Git, 
and gets shipped. It's that kicks off a pipeline, and then risk metrics, the risk metric package tests or com- performs risk metrics for the package in each version of R that we have, and that associated uh, library, and in all of the environments that we have on the system. A uh, manual, oh, sorry, a reviewer can then manually inspect these results and uh, arrive at an informed decision. If the reviewer chooses to approve this, then it will get fed to our system code and then released upon the next release of that system. So we now have a GXP environment and we have a strategy for packages, but we still do not have R code for producing tables, figures, and listings. We do not have BEX execution and logging capabilities in R. Uh, what about those? This is also handled by the packages, our internal packages. And these internal packages, they started as a single package, uh, one package to rule them all in 2018. And this was developed on a local laptop. And it was simply a gathering of all the useful functions that have been made. In 2020, we introduced the NN Biostat package that was simply be that was simply defined as the accepted packages. So users would write library in and Biostat and get the most useful packages. In 2021, we realized that NNR had become too big and it was split into uh, packages related to specific tasks. So NNR then became just a simple umbrella of all of these packages, like you know from Tidyverse. So the most important of our internal packages is in an access that is for getting data without worrying about paths or data formats. It's in an plot for creating novel style plots. It's in an table for which defines the grammar of tables for laying out tables and creating text uh, based output. So we wanted to mimic what we already did in SAS. It can also produce HTML outputs. We also have in an export for exporting tables, figures, and lists for that fit into our production pipeline. And we have in log for batch execution and logging. Here we actually use NIDA spin to create nice looking logs. So, and although these packages, they fit together in a complicated network, each package is just like in the real world, is uh, has its own repo. It is managed in an open source way internally. And we have version numbers, a maintainer group, we have pipelines, and we have boards for managing bugs, features, ideas, and much more. So we aimed to follow a common and good software principles of modularity, and we try to build up functionality like Lego bricks. So we try to segregate the responsibility of the packages and define appropriate extraction levels. So at the bottom here, you see the packages that are close to the system. They are system dependent, if you will. And on top, you see the packages that are close to the task at hand. At the top, users shouldn't worry about how, how the data is stored, where is it stored, and so on. They should just concentrate on the task. So for example, a programmer wishes to use NNTFL to make a mean plot that will call NN access to fetch ATOM data through a connection set up by NN remote. And after the plot has been made, NN export will take care of exporting the data to an appropriate data format and associated files that we need. So this has the benefit that we can change underlying architectures in the system and simply just do small changes in the lower level packages, if you will, uh, and the users won't see a difference. So this is also the reason that we could inject a caching system into the system. So let's talk about the tool chain that we use in Novo. So we use Git for version control and Azure pipelines for executing code upon code changes. We use use this for the description file and the news file. We use package down for generating a website of documentation, and we use our oxygen to write the documentation. We use lifecycle to convey the stability or 
or the life cycle of a function in within the packages, and we use test that and cover to test the packages. We also use R Markdown for writing longer format documentation in the form of vignettes, and we use Dev tools to uh, do the normal system. Sorry, the normal package development. So upon a code change, we will test again the packets in a matrix way. So we test against all our libraries, all our versions of R, and across all of our system um, environments. So we know that if, for example, an upcoming change in development to the system will, will break something in our packages. We then build the packets, and then we release it so in the process of releasing, we are updating the package down website and we ship it to the internal repo in the package manager. So we realized uh, some time ago, but we implemented it this year, that we need the ability to deprecate our versions. So say we no longer want to support uh, the, the oldest version of R we have and stop, then we can, then we have made uh, version specific repos um, so we can stop updating that this also allows for hot fixes if system changes are needed so we try to ensure a high level of code quality by enforcing a main branch policy nobody can change the main branch directly only pull requests to the main branch are accepted um, the pipeline needs to run with success and no errors a feature or bug needs to be linked to the pull request so we know why we have to change. And we need at least one maintainer to approve to ensure a code review. So now we both have a system and we both have the capabilities to execute our code. And I think I'll hand it over to Stefan so he can show you what it looks like in the real world. Yes. Thank you. So I would like to show you how a script usually looks uh, when we do it in Numenoidisk. So all programs we have will start with a header, as this I'm showing you now. Um, this header will include a short description of um, what the program is going to do. So in this case, we're going to derive summary statistics for <clears throat> um, antibody levels grouped by treatment and gender. We will have a very small outline, just indicating the most important steps of the program, making it easier to read for another programmer. Then the actual code will almost always start with a call to library in and biostat. This will ensure that we have the packages that are most, and most typically used in trial conduct loaded into the system, and that they are loaded in the same order for every program. When coming to the main part of the code, we will almost always use in an access because that's how we get access to the data. We can call in an access on a specific trial that will give us an, a trial access object. A trial access object will have uh, access to all of the trial connection, uh, collections uh, that are supported for the selected trial. In this case, uh, that could be, for instance, ADAM or SDTM. Here we're accessing ADAM data by calling db$adam, and then we can say what um, what data set we want to to extract. And notice here that we do not have any paths here. That is taken care of by in an access, and this means we can actually share this uh, code snippet without thinking about where it's actually executed. It will always give the same data set. It also allowed us to uh, inject this caching system so that every time a user uh, gets a data set that has already been loaded, we'll simply use the cache uh, and avoid long waiting time. So when having the data, we will usually use uh, normal dplyr calculations in order to derive the statistics that we want to use. So for instance, here we will filter the data, we will um, summarize the statistics that we want to put in the table. And then we can, in this case, group them by treatment, uh, gender, and the parameter code of uh, interest. This will give us 
all of the uh, data points that we would like to include in our table. However, now we had this goal that we wanted to produce tables um, that were identical to those produced in SAS so that we could be used in our usual um, pipelines for producing reports to authorities. However, we were using this text-based format, um, which has, has the tables that would span multiple pages, and we had no support for that in R. So we created our own package in a table for, for doing that. Now here you can initiate uh, a table rather easily. You simply state what data is this table going to use, and then you can say what columns are going to be in this table. You can do some light formatting, saying that we would like mean and standard deviation to de be displayed uh, as such, or we would like minimum and maximum to be displayed with a simple a semicolon between. This will produce a table uh, looking like this, um, but we wouldn't be quite happy yet. Now, normally, we would have all of the summary statistics nested under each other, um, so we would have to, to make the table a bit better. But you can note that we, uh, we have the uh, display that we, we wanted uh, and we said that we wanted in the call. In order to nest the summary statistics underneath the new variable, we use the functionality called uh, add trends long, where we can say we want these, um, these columns nested under a new column called sum. Um, and we could also add some formatting, for instance, say how many decimals do we want to apply for the different numbers. That will produce a table like this, which is a bit closer to what we usually have uh, in our reports. However, uh, you can see the two new columns uh, down the bottom, the sum and the uh, name column. Now we would usually have the sum column nested under treatment and perhaps uh, under uh, gender. And the type of summary statistics, which is the name column, would go under the parameter code. So we could use this by having these two uh, added lines of code, where we have add transpired, where we can say the summary column should be nested under treatment, which again should be nested under um, gender. Similar, we can add the stop of the table, saying we want a uh, name nested under the parameter code. And that will produce a table like this, which looks like something we've seen before, uh, that we are going to do in, at Novanoidisk. Uh, we are able to produce other types of tables using this. So we can export this via flex table to, for instance, PowerPoint or uh, a Word document or directly to HTML. But we are focusing today on what do we do when we want to export it to a simple file. And here we use the NN export functionality. Um, from the NN export package. Here we can simply say the output name um, that we want to export and a file name that we want to export it for. Then it will figure out the rest. And then we're actually done with a, with a script that can be used to produce such a table. And in order to run it, we will use a, a function called run script that comes from NN log. This uh, function can take both R documents and R markdown documents, and it can execute those in batch and in parallel. Uh, and it will give you some sort of information about how the um, execution actually went. In this case, we can see that the execution actually had an error. So let's inspect that log. As you can see here, uh, we get a nice HTML log. Um, and that log is produced via the spin functionality from the NIDA package. We can see that we have this header up in the top that just gives a short description of how did the execution actually go. Then we have the actual description and the outline that we put in top of our document. And we can see here they are nicely formatted. After that comes all of the code chunks that we have. We will also see all of the outputs in the log. And in this case, we saw that we had an error. Um, it will also highlight both errors and warnings so that they're very easy to see as you scroll through the log.
And finally, in the end of these logs, we always have uh, an expanded session info. Now, this session info will include both um, session uh, information about the packages that we had in the session, but also packages that were simply available at the system. It will also include um, options that were set in the environment and other environment info. But that is actually how we execute scripts uh, and how we do them in Nomo Nordisk in general. But I will hand it over to Anas, and Anas will tell us a bit about how we got our colleagues to actually do this. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Yeah, so once again, um, the way we have primarily been doing our user support and our education is to let everybody know that uh, there's help to to be made. So you, the help is here. So we have primarily been supporting people via a one-stop shop website uh, that collects all of these Pakistan sites. Um, and recently we have uh, introduced Stack Overflow for Teams uh, as a Q&A. Until then, we have been using Microsoft Teams, we have been using DevOps, we have been using plain old mail uh, to, to do this support. In terms of education, we have promoted self-learning and learning by doing. This has been done through a podcast, as Phil mentioned, and we have internal e-learning as well. This is built on top of degreed.com. We also provide lots of external references and e-learning to the outside world, the ones you can find on the web. We have done courses and demos on how to get started with R and Novo, uh, but it's really the, the website that has been doing the heavy lifting. So the, pe the, the website looks like this, and we call it the rdoc homepage. You simply write r-doc in the browser when you're on the corporate network, and you'll be taken to this. So it's a one point of entry homepage for everything. We had the motto that everything should be here. If you cannot find it here, then it should be here and we will make it. So this site collects all the documentation and references just mentioned. It has the podcast, it has the Pakistan website, it has vignettes, long format documentation. It has an entire output catalog so you can see uh, how a program is structured, it has lots of guides and more. Uh, we also link further on to all of these e-learning and education, education sites. Something that is that you all know that is present in R, this is not actually a given in other languages where you can simply write help uh, in the IDE and get the documentation. So we of course also convey this to our users. And we really try to write high quality documentation on our packages. Uh, so you can get this right away. We've also tried to do the equivalent of use this uh, in a package called in and init, and this will help you get started the first time you log in. It will help you troubleshoot if you have any, any problems. It will help you initialize and set up stuff, trials, repos, new packages, just in general, initiating stuff. And we have also tried to integrate and utilize all the R Studio features with add-ins and snippets to make some uh, nicer user experience. The podcast is 10 to 15 minutes of how-tos of everything from the complex to the very simple. How do you get started? Um, how do you make your first output? That sort of stuff. And again, anybody can contribute here. The one thing I want to highlight is this Stack Overflow for Teams. We have just recently uh, rolled this out. It's only a month old, but we can tell all already now that it's, that it's going to be really good. We have already 174 questions and 255, sorry, not 55, 25 answers in there and 65 daily active users. So we really had no good place for Q&A and we wanted to avoid answering the same questions again and again. Uh, so this site really helps spread the support burden. It helps build you a knowledge base, and it's not just for code. And this is also familiar to all programmers. So there's no education for this needed. 
So if we have any regrets uh, in terms of change management, it is that we didn't get this out sooner. So now I'll hand it back to Ari and he'll tell you about the submission. Now, <clears throat> getting back to what I highlighted in the beginning, uh, we've always believed in the power of taking steps rather than thinking about how big they should be and to put everything in Anna's and uh, Stephen uh, into perspective and how you could do all of this while doing a drop project. We'll just look at a quick uh, timeline of the development here. <clears throat> so in 2019, we got the commitment to report a trial in another language than CES. In the beginning of 2020, we had uh, collected functionalities into two R packages. Um, soon after that, we initiated the first uh, R program on this trial, chosen to be the first one reported in another language than CES. Um, and we even did that before we had the first workbench in production. Unfortunately, the trial got delayed, uh, but we were determined to prove that we uh, could use R in our deliverables. And we did an experiment with delivering a DSUR instead. Later on in 2020, we uh, split up uh, the functionalities and created packages and package shelf of everything that was to come. And we were working on the documentation and released the R doc uh, homepage in the end of uh, 2020. And from doing this DSUR, we just learned an incredible amount of stuff um, doing our first deliverable. So we updated a lot of core functionalities in the packages. We update the workbench once more with uh, load balancing and multiple servers. Uh, soon after that, I managed to convince our management that we're now ready to run uh, phase three trials in R and we do the first commits on these trials. Immediately after that, we follow up with uh, five uh, clinical pharmacology trials. And finally, uh, right before Christmas and the end of 2021, we uh, report uh, our first trial ever in another language than CES. And between uh, 2022 and 2023, we just have an incredible amount of first happening. Uh, and we also update the workbench once more because we're sending so much data in and out of it now that it uh, crashes uh, when we run these big uh, atom programs. So what we end up with is a huge uh, package of uh, R-based uh, TFL programs and some atom programs in R. But basically after we proved uh, in the end of 2020, that it was possible to deliver a DSUR that followed basically all of the same processes internally as we do for clinical trials. We were using R in all project deliverables from that point on. One thing to note is that we initially did not intend to submit all of those uh, RTFL programs. If we look at uh, FDA guidance, then our plan was to submit uh, all of our ADAM programs uh, including those made in R, and then having those uh, RTFL programs internally, uh, and instead submit our CES parallel programs for our primary and uh, secondary efficacy analysis, which is something that we have done uh, in projects before. And that leaves us with this gray area uh, that we were still creating a strategy for. I'll get back uh, to this in just a second. The Atom uh, R programs they, we submitted, they were designed with uh, minimal dependencies on uh, internal packages, as we weren't sure how to best submit packages at this point in time. We did use our internal package uh, in an access uh, for getting access to data, but we didn't plan on submitting just as we didn't submit uh, ses based macros uh, that only work uh, internally. We did still think that we needed to uh, tell authorities about our views of R. Uh, so you can see here an excerpt from a type C meeting package where we mention that we plan on submitting R uh, programs and we will specify R related stuff in the ADHG and submit internal packages if they are not uh, publicly available. In our uh, pre-BLA meeting package, we get uh, more specific and we mentioned that we intend to use uh, the R package, uh, package light, uh, which packages R packages to TXT uh, in order to pass them through the submission gateway at the FDA. 
Uh, this initial approach is the method used by the R Consortium Working Group R for submission uh, in their first pilot uh, submission to FDA. We also mirror uh, their approach in the ADHG, where we add something about R in the standard section, and we add an additional very short appendix uh, on what you would need in order to run the atom programs. So with this, we bundle everything together and we uh, submit our first uh, multilingual uh, submission package to FDA. But there's still this uh, gray area that we need to tackle because we know that PMDA has already made a pre-submission request for additional TFL programs. And we know that it's not unusual for FDA or other health authorities to ask for uh, additional programs. And lo and behold, it doesn't take long until we receive this. An information request from FDA stating, to facilitate the efficiency of the safety review, submit all programming codes used to create the tables and figures in the ISS and the safety sections of the CSRs. And now we're thinking, chip, it's real. We really need to figure this out and we only have 10 days to do it. You can imagine the, the stressed looks on our faces and a lot of uh, deep breaths that need to be uh, taken at this point in time. But uh, after we have call, calmed ourselves uh, down a bit, uh, we, we get to it. So we knew all trials have been executed with the RENV setup. So we could use the RENV log files to uh, look up versions of all of the internal packages. We then use uh, package light to take uh, package sources and uh, repackage them all into a single package slide file uh, for each trial. In the submission, we now included uh, the package slide file, the RENV log file uh, packaged to text and modified to use MRAN for public packages. We include RENV's uh, activate script that bootstraps uh, RENV. And then a script that would unpack uh, source packages, set up a seller for uh, RENV, rebuild the packages, and initialize an R project with the RENV setup uh, within a dedicated folder structure such that all of the internal Novo packages could run. In the ADHG, we uh, update um, the appendix to include some information on uh, these new files that we're submitting and which commands were needed to restore the environment and how you could modify the NN access function uh, uh, in order to make it run in a local R project. So we bundle all of this together and ship a whole bunch of R-based uh, TFL programs together with the R packages and these additional files uh, to the FDA. And again, I mean, at this point in time, we're at, uh, on top of the world. I mean, we did it. Now we also submitted packages and even within this deadline. But FDA returns again and they can't get it to work. And now we're really thinking, Shit. And together with that message, they also include the following in the information request. Submit R code for all safety analysis with as minimal package dependency as possible and no dependencies to R packages developed internally by Novo Nordisk. And now we're really thinking shit. At this point in time, we're doubting everything that you heard up until now in this presentation. The package strategy, the submission strategy, uh, the future of R at Novo Nordisk. We poured so much energy into making this a reality, and now we're at this pivotal moment where, I mean, we make it or we break it. They can't restart the environment, and they want us to reprogram all of the programs. So what do we do? We do something we very, very rarely do. We invite FDA for an informal meeting. In the meantime, we go back uh, looking at our build script and optimize it once more. We also optimize um, the RNV uh, log file to use uh, POSIT's public package manager, as at this point in time, MRAN has now shut down. We write a very long 
and very detailed instruction with screenshots of everything that's happening and what you should expect to see when you're restoring the environment, when you're executing uh, different parts of the scripts. And we shift this off to FDA before the meeting, hoping that we now have done it right. Now, this meeting happened quite recently. And minutes before the meeting, we are quite nervous. Like, what are they going to say? Are we going to be grilled? And the meeting starts, and it turns out they now have been successful in restoring the environment. And we were just thinking, yes. And they bring up the programs and mention that part of the reason for them asking um, is that it gives FDA an opportunity to see how code inside and outside of packages are built. And this would be a great learning opportunity for uh, FDA. The statistical reviews in the meeting with FDA are just so super nice. And we realize one very important thing from this meeting. Uh, submissions in R is new to us, but it's definitely new to FDA as well. And this brings us to the future where we have three main points that we want to dive deeper into. We want to have a stronger R dedication. We want improvements to recreating environments outside of the NN walls. And we want to fully embrace the open source. As part of the R dedication, we have multiple fully R-based projects already started and now also dedicated teams to support our package and uh, system development. We have learned some very valuable uh, environment lessons around the uh, rebuilding across uh, operating systems. Um, and the fact that the official posit, uh, package manager stored binaries of packages was uh, really invaluable in this submission as we didn't need to compile from a source on Windows machines. And we already have many ideas for how we can work tests around this into our uh, workflows and also guide colleagues and peers uh, for regulatory interaction. And last but not least, fully embrace open source. The cleanup of all of our internal packages will start soon, and we will move towards open development on uh, GitHub. We will rebuild a lot of our core functionalities such that it will work for the broader programming community and aim to get our packages onto CRAN and dive much deeper into uh, Farmerverse. Before we uh, end, I really want to acknowledge uh, all the package contributors and system contributors that we have, the programmers and statisticians that fought to learn R on these trials throughout a very hectic time, uh, the invaluable input and knowledge coming from our peers at other companies working with R, uh, working groups under R Consortium, the R Validation Hub, and all the efforts going into making something like this possible. We would also like to acknowledge the fact that FDA agreed to uh, meet with us and advertise in the end of the day. It's also just nice, normal people working at FDA. They are much more open and welcoming of art than we anticipated. And we encourage that you reach out just as we did. So thank you so much for listening to our presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Novo team. That was fantastic. Gosh, what a what an aid this is going to be for other pharmas going down this path. Um, we have more questions than I think we have time for. So we're going to tackle a few of them. And they also came in at different times before you had got to that point later on in the presentation. So if you think we've already tackled it, just let me know. But I'm going to go based off of popularity. And we've got 30 plus questions. So let's tackle a few of them. Um, and so let's start off with this first one. Um, how can we ensure that R code, including internal R packages, is responsible, is reproducible on a reviewer's machine such as that of the FDA? That is a very good yes. question. Would you take it, Stephen? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so so that is a good question. And of course, we cannot completely ensure it. Um, what we can ensure is that we can reproduce the environment such that they have the same packages available, the same version of R available, that they, in that way, they, we can make sure that they have 
uh, data in the places we would like them to have data in, uh, and that way use our programs. Um, and that was what we did in the scripts that we sent to them now, was to to actually, from the file that we have submitted in this uh, M5 folder structure, make it possible to recreate um, the entire folder structure that we normally work upon, and then reuse the in and access facility and an embiased functionality to ensure that the packages that they have loaded is the same um, as what we are seeing. Um, and, and thereby be very close to a fact that they will get the same results as us, as close as we can get. Fantastic. Anybody else on the Nova team want to mention, comment? No, I think that's yeah. sufficient. Yeah, perhaps, <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's go to another question here. So um, the next question says, how long before it becomes a common practice in Novo to use R for trial-related programming? So I think, well, so, I mean, I, I think uh, doing this one uh, drug project uh, at first has really kind of kicked off uh, like an internal revolution for, for doing this because we proved that it was possible to do it uh, it's been hard and difficult, and there's a lot of change management involved. But the benefits we've seen from this, uh, like reusing TFL objects into result meeting slides, like all the benefits we get from doing HTML-based stuff now is just spilling over into to other projects. I think uh, probably we're closing in on maybe 30%, 40% of the trials now are starting up in, in R. Um, and we have, I think, 115 trials ongoing currently. Um, so the uptake is uh, is quite big. Fantastic. Any other comments? Let's jump to the nope. next one. All right. So the next one is about the scope of the undertaking. How many personnel are needed to maintain the complexity of this environment? Will you take that, Stefan? Um, yeah, so that's a, a hard question <laughs> also. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, at Nomad Nordics, this has really been a bottom-up uh, adventure where we, we saw from the, the top that we would like us to uh, make this report of trial in another language than R. Um, yes. Or there, then says. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we were pretty much allowed to run with it. Um, so we've been... A few people working on the packages, I would guess six uh, that would do usual commits. We have been uh, mainly three to work on the statistical computing environment. Um, in terms of the actual development of it, we had way more in terms of getting it DXP validated um, because there we, yeah, that's just a much, much bigger uh, adventure. Uh, but in terms of active development, um, yeah. And then how many for actual trial conduct? For actual trial conduct. I mean, there's been a very steep learning curve uh, uh, on, on the trial. So I would say there's anything between uh, yeah, 30, 40, 50 programs and statisticians that have been running all of these trials, uh, creating our programs. Uh, mm. I must say all the trials have been running in parallel, which has also made the workload uh, quite a lot bigger. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of people have been uh, involved in doing the actual trial conduct. Um, yeah. yeah. And and one thing, thing I think we need to add is also that we get, you know, as we do it internally open source, lots of people step up and contribute. For the, the podcast, for example, is, you know, somebody came up with that and we said, go with it. Let's put it on this RDOX thing. The same with this degree. Another guy came up with that. And so we just grab those balls and we really try to encourage our users and our friends to 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 do to, to that to do that sort of thing. So it's um, so it's it's hard to put in terms of FTEs uh, because we can't really can't we don't know actually. <laughs> yes. And and on that point, that's what been a learning for for us who have been developing the packages first to to actually start to let go and let the community uh, be the main drivers 
Uh, so for instance, for this uh, table package that we have, we're getting more and more contributors around the company for features that they would like uh, it to, to include. And also feature requests, of course, as why can't I use the DT package directly from this? So we will, of course, start to implement that uh, so that it, it has full uh, support for that as well. Um, yeah. Fantastic. So I've got a couple more questions. So I'm let's um, I'm going to go a little bit faster on these just because we uh, we've got a lot of people still on. So let's keep going. <laughs> So this next one uh, said, what can you clarify by what you mean by first R-based submission? And it says, are all the programs in code were in R? Yeah, so all of the tables, figures, and listings that we've made have all been in R. So uh, at Novo, we have been using um, uh, a data set for analysis results for quite some time, meaning that the statistical analysis are still done in SAS, put into a huge data set, and then reported through uh, our uh, TFL programs. So statistical analysis are still onto the side, onto uh, and into SAS. Um, but everything else uh, in regards to TFL have been uh, developed in R. And then as well, we have some of these uh, uh, R-based atom programs, uh, which have primarily been for the data set where we just need the additional uh, compute power that we can get from being in the cloud because they have been extremely huge. Awesome. Another question. What were the business benefits of an R solution you know, relative to commercials or, or uh, for example, SaaS? That's a good question. Um, I guess so. Like Stefan said, this spills over, or I believe it's UI. It, it spills over in all sorts of other things. So when we do presentation slides or we do other stuff, uh, it's much more easy to pick up and do something more powerful with these um, shiny apps and so on. They also can utilize the packages, so we can kind of again uh, build up functionality. So it really spills over, but it's again, it's impossible to say, like in terms of uh, uh, money, how much again it is. But we see it kind of starting to permeate uh, into other non-GXP tasks and, and other stuff that we do. And, and one other very important aspect from the from the business side have been how do we get more employees uh, enrolled oh. in biostatistics because we are uh, doing more and more trials so we need more and more employees um, and here we have seen that there are just so many more uh, people we can get who know R uh, than there are actually people coming out who, who know SAS so from a, a business benefits I would say one of the highest values is uh, getting new employees uh, and getting them up to speed fast. Yeah, definitely. So you just mentioned research and other areas. Um, and for the late stage here, a question that comes up, I think a lot of people are wondering about is, do you plan to use Python in a submission too? And does your scientific or, or statistical computing environment support Python and our development and apps? Uh, we have Python on the system. It is uh, an experimental feature, if you will. So, uh, and as far as I know, we don't have any plans for doing Python-based submissions, uh, but we feel that there is a pressure. Uh, so the users or some users really want that as well. Uh, so now we are trying to come up with similar strategies for handling Python so that so you can really have a, a true multilingual system. We have seen, we have started the process, but it is a bit harder with Python, Python uh, than R because we don't have um, CRAN, um, where we have a much, much better control. And we know that the uh, packages are tested together. So we can have this uh, nice strategy for how we put the packages in, where we know that these packages are going to function together. That doesn't really apply to Python. So that is at least a, a the problem that we are tackling right now yeah. <laughs> in order to, to do it. Awesome. Well, how about one more question here? Um, sure. 
how often do you update your different R environments? Yes, so um, we've been uh, been doing, I guess if we even them out, it would be like a half yearly update. Um, but it has depended on, on how big are the features that we're working on. Uh, quite recently, we had a, a, a large gap between them because we were working on this uh, Kubernetes cluster. So it was sort of a big thing. Uh, we needed to develop the Kubernetes cluster and also uh, get it DXP approved before we could release it to the broader community. Uh, so there we had, I think, almost a year. Uh, but usually it would be about every half yearly. And then we have a commitment, both in terms of user request, uh, but also for ourselves, that we really want to go down to every second month to, to have updates of the system um, so that new packages can get to users much, much faster uh, than they do now. And also, I mean, if we're diving more into open source, where the release cycle, at least from the stuff we see in farm reverses, is, is quite fast. Like we need to be up to speed if we want to include like the latest updates into our trials as well. So yes, we really want to get the release cycle down. Yeah, exactly. But one thing though, um, even though we have a rather strict uh, package management strategy, we have made it so that all users can actually, uh, if they work a little bit for it, not much, uh, but just change the repository, uh, the options repos argument, then they can lock themselves into a newer uh, version of the packages and start working from there. Um, so it is possible, and we do have some projects that are starting to do that, uh, if they feel that the system has fallen a bit too uh, much behind, that we need to work with the newer packages available then we have shown them, OK, how can you do that yourself and still ensure that you are uh, compliant? So my team just mentioned that we still have a lot of people on. So if you have some time, let's <laughs> keep going. What the heck, right? The questions keep flooding <laughs> yeah. in. Um, how about this one? I, I like this. So for your next R-based submission, uh, what are some things you might do differently that jump out to you? I think one thing is, um, I mean, we realize now that a statistical reviewer of, uh, at FDA or another health authorities uh, might not have adequate time to uh, kind of get acquainted with a whole set of packages that's being submitted. Uh, meaning that if you're building like super smart functionality in a lot of packages and they all like really work well together, uh, getting that kind of thrown in the face as a reviewer uh, might be too much and you wouldn't have time to dive deeper into it. So we're thinking of a lot of ways of how do we expose like the derivations, the calculations, the analysis uh, that we're doing in programs, either through like better logs or kind of uh, surfacing more of uh, like the deep plot-based uh, derivations that we're doing. Um, and then, uh, I mean, we want to do a submission with uh, Admiral as well. We want to use more of these uh, farm reverse packages in them. Um, and definitely, as I mentioned here, uh, testing in a Windows-based operating system is something we will definitely be building into kind of our submission pipeline that it is, it is something that just needs to work. Um, so, yeah. Fantastic. All right. How about two more? And uh, then I officially will uh, will end the webinar for today. So how about given the significant overlap between the responsibilities and functions of IT and biostats, how was collaboration between these two uh, sectors facilitated? Definitely. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is actually a good example of this. Uh, we, at the very first time, um, the IT development sort of developed an R server uh, without so much response from uh, biostatistics. Um, and in that server, we, we said, you can go here and you can start programming. And the first thing I tried was, uh, okay, so I want to install Tidyverse so that I could uh, get going 
you know, uh, no, no, uh, that won't work here. We, we don't have all of these things installed in the system so that you can actually do that. And okay, okay. so I can't even use tidyverse. <laughs> this is going to be an, yeah, a steep, steep climb if we're going to use base R for everything. Um, so, so from that day, we, we started a really, really close collaboration because we sort of saw the need that even though you know everything about IT, um, you might not know all the needs uh, that there are for an, an R-based system. Um, so from there, we would have uh, both R developers and IT developers working closely together, uh, ensuring that we would yeah, have the best system possible for the end user. Um, yeah. OK, last question. This is it, I promise. How about, you know, one thing we hear a lot about are other regulatory agencies besides the FDA for submissions. So someone says, can you share about your experience with our submissions outside of the FDA, EMA, PMDA, et cetera? Yeah, so I really want to bring up uh, an example from the, the R Consortium Working Group, uh, R for Submission, where we also try to reach out to PMDA uh, through some of our uh, peers uh, in the Japanese Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Association, JPMA. And uh, the message we got back from uh, from PMDA was that they, they didn't feel a need for a pilot submission because they already accepted our submissions. Um, and what we, we have still uh, included in, uh, in our um, Correspondences with the PMDA, for instance, that we're using R for different stuff. We've uh, giving them flowcharts of stuff, and uh, with PMDA, we even um, suggested that we would submit uh, RDS files instead of uh, XPT files, just because we had these huge data sets that were more than 250 gigabytes in XPT, which uh, I think any local laptop would be. Uh, be, it would be difficult to open uh, those up. So, and they've been very uh, open. Um, and I would say, uh, from all the health authorities that we have uh, talked with, none of them are questioning the use of R. They are still coming with the same scientific questions about the submission. Of course, here we uh, got some technical uh, questions about restoring the environment, but it was it, it was because they wanted uh, to make it work. Um, so only positive things, I would say. Well, fantastic. Thank you again. I think this has been one heck of a webinar and the community is going to really enjoy watching this afterwards. I suspect we also can tackle some of these other questions, maybe in a blog post. So thank you so much, Ari, Stefan, Anders, truly wonderful to hear about your experience, the journey you went down and, and the collaboration with the community and internally has been fantastic. So with that, uh, we do thank you one last time and thank you to the community that's turned out for the webinar today. And stay tuned, we'll be posting this online here soon for those of you that may have missed some parts. And hopefully we see you at R and Pharma coming up in October. And with that, we'll bid everybody farewell and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you everybody.